Hey, I'm Eric. I'm the Explorer. I'm Phil. I'm the Folklorist. And together we are setting out across the Empire State to explore the haunts and legends of New York. Baron de Steuben was known as the drill master of the Continental Army. His knowledge of military discipline helped Washington's army win the revolution. In thanks for his service, Baron de Steuben was granted a large tract of land in upstate New York near Remsen. The Baron's grandiose plans called for a village with his homestead at the center. Embracing the teachings of the Enlightenment, Steuben's plans incorporated many aspects of Masonic iconography. Join the search for the Masonic secrets of New York's Baron Steuben. Well, Phil, we are up in northern Oneida County, a beautiful, quiet, tranquil park. What's the story behind this cabin and this park? Well, actually, we're at the Steuben Memorial and the Steuben Memorial Park, but there's something a little bit different about this park than any other national park or state park that you've ever known. Looks like a nice tranquil field, doesn't it? Sure does, it's, it's gorgeous. But not what its original plan is or what some of these markers are that we see here today. Really? Let's go to find out about them. Let's get the real story. So Nancy, you know, I come at the Baron from pretty basic knowledge. I know there's the town of Steuben, I've heard of the monument, but who exactly is this Baron von Steuben? Ah, ah, great question. I've been studying the Baron for about 22 years now. As, as I mentioned before, when I, I came on board in the region in 1993, we did not have a whole lot in the files about just the general history of the Baron. And what I knew in general for, about the Baron is from the 1930s, really. Um, to give you the quick thumbnail sketch, the Baron was a gentleman with a very strong and very wide-ranging military background f from the Prussian army with Frederick the Great. So he came over um, with a little finagling by Benjamin Franklin because after all early on, earlier, there had been streams of European gentlemen, European uh, officers of other armies um, that had been given kind of the red carpet treatment going into Washington's Continental Army. And Congress was getting pretty sick of it. So Franklin had to really kind of sweet talk the Continental Congress into accepting this gentleman. By far, uh, more than all of the other recruits, he had, in my estimation, one of the best military backgrounds for the type of war at the time that we had to fight. So he makes it over, he goes before the Continental Congress, he gets accepted and he shows up at Valley Forge. And he makes his way into Valley Forge and he meets George Washington and Washington at that point was involved with the Conway Cabal. He had suffered some pretty big losses in early on in the revolutionary days and people were calling for him to be removed as the commander-in-chief and the Baron comes in in the middle of all of this and looking at it from an organizational point of view very quickly understood what was wrong with how we were doing business and so he very quickly was able to set up a system of drill to get the men working together instead of working against each other. So let's jump to that point. So the war is over now mm -hmm. and he's decided not to go back to Europe and stay in this new country, this new America. How exactly did he end up here in upstate New York? In upstate New York, especially with our winters, right? right. <laughs> it's like, you know, in the 18th century, they don't have Gore-Tex, they don't have polar fleece. It's like, what? What are you doing? So the Baron it retires. The last official act that George Washington does is on behalf 
of Baron Steuben, which tells you a lot in terms of the high esteem that Washington held for this man. And he basically wrote a wonderful thank you letter and a letter of loyalty and duty to the Baron so that there would be absolutely no question in anybody, anybody's mind that he was second unto Washington in terms of having won the Revolutionary War. So the Baron is faced with, what do I do now? He doesn't really have any money. Uh, he, even though he was the eldest son of the family, he could have gone back to Europe, but Europe really didn't hold anything for him. He was very much a student of the Enlightenment, and you can see that in his belonging to the Masons and some of his writings about the Enlightenment, how to teach, how to treat people. Um, and he wanted to stay here in the United, what was to become the United States because of that very solid foundation of the Enlightenment being our founding doctrine, basically. And so he also felt as though he was due a retirement for having slogged it out for eight long years. And so he was hoping to make his nest egg with his pension. Um, the Continental Congress, however, fussed around with his petition, his application for a pension, for seven years. So <clears throat> the Baron is waiting and waiting and waiting. And in the meantime, different states, uh, as individual states now, we're not talking about the federal government, we're talking about the individual states give him little tracts of land in recognition and in thanks for his contribution during the Revolutionary War. New York gave him the largest tract of land. And through the years, these seven years that he's waiting for the final word from Congress, he's selling off bits and pieces of his other tracts of land out in the Ohio territories, down in the Virginia areas, down in New Jersey, all these little bits. He's bartering and parlaying into sustaining himself until Congress makes a decision. So that's how he landed here in New York State with his property nor 20 miles north of Utica. But what the Baron's dream was, being a, a courtly man, being an educated man, he wanted to be in the excitement of what was going on with the new nation, the, the Constitution developing, the changes in the military structure, the new industry, the new frontier. So this was a very exciting time for a man like him. He was a businessman of sorts and he had all of this land up here which he wanted to turn into townships and farms and mills and basically have like a little mini Steuben estate similar to what you have in um, in Europe during his youth and he would come up to his lands here in the summertime to clear it to build buildings to to recruit people to come in and he would lease them or sell them little plots of land for their special farm etc 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 1824 this is a steel plate engraving of what the cabin the original cabin looked like but again where does that come from mm -hmm. and it's based on a pencil sketch that actually looks quite different uh, but in, 18, in 1927, when they decided to replicate the cabin, this is what they used as a reference. So what we see up there is inaccurate. It's a great homage to the Baron's frontier life, but in terms of architectural accuracy, it's, it's not the best. The artist rendering. <laughs> exactly, exactly. He died in 1794. He was buried up there in his will and in some of his other communication. He did not want anything fancy. He wanted to be buried in the clothes that he died in, wrapped in his military cloak, and put out in the pasture um, just alone. No big ceremony, no nothing. Okay, And so they did that for him, his neighbors. 
and his few aides that were there. And one of the reasons why he wanted to be wrapped in his military cloak was that it was the thing that kept him warm throughout the Revolutionary War. It was probably in tatters at that point because this is well after mm -hmm. the Revolutionary War, but it also had his Order of Fidelity embroidered on it. It was applique to it, which is what um, he received as an honor in, um, in Germany. Since he was in an unmarked grave, when they widened one of the roads up in Stuben, they ran into him. <laughs> and he comes shooting out, <laughs> and he's like, oh my god, excuse me. <laughs> so they had to pick him up and gather him all together, because he was kind of, you know, that's the Baron, he's all over the place. So they, found, they, they, they dug him a new grave, they put him into it, and they put a little bit of a marker over it. And then the War of 1812 comes along, and there's all of this celebration, renewed celebration about the Revolutionary War. Yay, we beat the, we beat the British again, so they want to put uh, a little sarcophagus kind of thing, a little plinth marker over the Baron. So they do that, and then it falls into disrepair. And the centennial comes around, and it's like, oh my gosh, we have to save the Baron again. We're going to make it bigger and better. At this point, the state gets involved, because before it was just, a, just his family, his mm -hmm. local family. And then it was the township, and then it was the state. And that's when they put this big gothic pile of rocks on top of them. Okay. 1877. They created the, the state park in 1932. Franklin Roosevelt came himself and opened it, dedicated it, and I'm tracking down the information on that. I now have a copy of the speech that he gave, and um, New York, he went out of his way that New York claimed the Baron as a son. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then in 1937, they built the, uh, the cabin, the replica cabin, which has been restored and restored and restored and restored ever since then. Now, the field and basically the land that's up there now, the cabin and stuff, that's not how he envisioned it. No, not at all. Not it's at actually, all. he's got very elaborate plans, doesn't he? Very elaborate plans. And this is, this is the really neat breadcrumb trail that we've been following for the last 22 years. And this was the blueprint of what his grand estate was supposed to be. Um, and this is Benjamin Wright. All, these are the surveys of all of his acres to try and get us located in a, in a time and in a physical place. And he, the fact that he was given 16,000 acres, you know, that's a lot of acreage. A lot of acreage. Okay. Now with the furrow map, this had, like I said before, this had to come out of somewhere. And this was done by uh, Furrow in 1794, the year that the Baron would die later on in the year. So over the summer, he drew the furrow map. And it's a watercolor, exquisite detail. And it identifies the roads and the buildings. There was going to be a school, a sawmill, you know, all sorts of things. And the Baron's property was going to, or his house was going to be right smack dab in the middle. And we have these wonderful views looking out over the, the Steuben Valley. <clears throat> but the idea had to come from somewhere. Fro wasn't just drawing it based on mm -hmm. what Steuben was saying. So we were able to backtrack in 1792 a pencil sketch that apparently was either done by Benjamin Walker or the Baron Steuben himself. So finally we end up with this. This is the core out of the larger furrow map and you can see the gradations of it or the evolution of it, okay? So the more I look at it the more you start to see the way space is broken up and it would appear, and I've heard people talk about this, but talk about it in very hushed tones because they think you're nuts if you really want to put any credence into this, that the way this is laid out embodies certain Masonic symbols like the circles and the squares and the angles 
and the almighty eye, the all-seeing eye, in terms of the view from the house and the apprentice's um, apron and the circles representing the greater world and the, the, I don't know if you can see it, but if you look here, there was going to be a pond here and there is a uh, correspondence talking about he and, some, and Benjamin Wright, I think it was, spending the day digging for this pond. Well, if you take a look at the angles, okay, and the view from the house going through the center of the house, it was going to be a, a, a block with two wings. You can see the triangle, mm -hmm. the Masonic triangle with the all-seeing eye right there, smack dab in the middle. You know, what is it? Well, you know what's interesting when, you know, the other <coughs> city that always comes up when you talk about was it designed with Masonic influence is Washington, Washington D.C. And this yeah. is the same era. Right. Right? Same era. And that was designed by Lafont, mm -hmm. who knew the Baron, who worked with the Baron through the army. And so, of course, why not? Right. You know, and it's this grid system, and then the angles off the grid system. Mm -hmm. Now, is it on purpose? Or is it just an accidental function of geometry? Mm -hmm. Well, if it's an accidental function of geometry, then it could very well be on purpose because they were looking for the sign right. of what right. life is all about mm -hmm. and how to lead the honorable life and how to treat each other and how to get rid of the old world despot syndrome mm -hmm. of monarchs and princes and cruelty and 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 the abject poverty not just in terms of physical life but intellectual life but wh when you take a look at the fact that Frederick the Great was buried in his garden that is very Masonic so anyway Baron Steuben was first buried in his garden mm -hmm. okay and it's it's to return to your most humble roots and the Masonic credo of making good men better and that's what he was all about so anyway when we started to, to study this a light went off in my head that you take it you go back to some of the original sketches and the building is supposed to look like this it's the center block with two mm -hmm. wings but on the furrow map, all of a sudden, it's been turned into this columnated hunk with these two, two little wings that have been tucked up and off to the side, which is a more timely uh, design mm -hmm. for the times, more reflective of the times. Wow. It's the Baron Steuben's front elevation, okay? Now you take a look at this and it's like, wow! Where did that come from? Mm -hmm. So you go back into, back into his life. You take a look at this form. This is right out of neoclassical. This is the temple of Athena, mm -hmm. which is the gathering place, the, the temple of friendship. And in one of the Baron's uh, letters, he talks about picnicking with friends out under the temple of friendship, which was a tent in his front yard overlooking the Hudson River Valley. So there's he's constantly revisiting these aspects of his physical life that he's had since a child that he's grown up with that have great meaning for him. So you've got that matched up. You've got the temple front here and this is right out of this and the colonnade mm -hmm. and all of that is right out of Saint Souci right out of it. It's almost exactly copied out of Sans Souci, which was the summer palace for Frederick the Great. Well, Phil, this is actually what was intended to be the main entrance off of uh, Star Hill Road into the memorial. So we know that the Baron's grave sat directly, because we're, we're across from the Sacred Grove now, yep. where his gravesite is. And this is what Nancy was talking about. These pines lined up like a century, like centuries, like soldiers. Yep, so he's always inspecting them as they're going by on the road, which is through here. Fascinating, the entrance that you can't use anymore to the Steuben Memorial.
Wow, Phil, fascinating. Masonic history, the symbolism of the trees lined up like the Baron was still drilling his troops. What a fascinating place I really knew nothing about. There's just so much history here and it's all in the geography if you look at how everything's laid out. And this is one of the most important people, one of the top three that won the Revolutionary War. This man who's now mostly forgotten and this park, this land has such a hidden history. And we can really claim him as our own here in New York. This is the, this is the home of Baron von Steuben. This is the home of Steuben. This is also where presidents have walked. This is where we've had ambassadors from other countries. And he had such an ornate plan. It was just unbelievable. I, it makes me wish we could have seen that come to fruition here in Steuben outside of Remsen. This would be as big, if not bigger, than Monticello in Virginia. Yeah, Monticello, Mount Vernon, you add it to that pantheon of historic American sites. And it's right here in upstate New York. Hey, if you're enjoying this Haunts and Legends of New York series, give this video a thumbs up and hit the comments below to let us know where else we should go. And subscribe to get more. It's the Haunts and Legends of New York.